Uh, there's just no, there are many reasons kids get shot in school, but there's not one good reason. There's not one good reason that that they would be. So there's a clear way to protect American, and that's what the book's about. It starts out empowering parents to ask questions. We learned so much during COVID, right? We learned about who's teaching our kids and what they're teaching them and all that. Uh, and so it's a constant fight between school boards and and uh, school administration and parents that that don't understand each other so this book gives parents my checklist of questions to ask school boards and they better answer and welcome to the firearms nation podcast and if this is your first time here thank you for coming by if you're watching the video Thank you. If you're listening to the audio, you've been listening for a long time, uh, or this could be your first time, I should say. But, uh, you know, we are up on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts, we're on pretty much any podcasting platform. We're doing something new this year. We're also making these podcast episodes available online on YouTube. And eventually we'll start streaming out to other places. Uh, but, you know, you can always catch uh, these episodes on the Firearms Nation YouTube channel. So thank you all for being there. And of course, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe, right? Uh, Apple Podcast, uh, it's real easy to hit that little plus button and then you subscribe to it. On YouTube, you just, you know, hit that uh, subscribe, which is pretty easy. It says subscribe there. Uh, but the reason we do that is, you know, these social platforms, these media platforms, when they see that people are interested in some content, they're going to push that content forward and it'll, it'll show up more stuff related to firearms and, and safety and security and tactics, all these things that we talk about on the show. So it's, it's, it's really important to, to get that subscription out there and, uh, we appreciate it. Uh, tonight is, a uh, uh, great guest. I'm, I'm so happy to have back on. He's been a, a friend of the nation. I always try and reach out to friends of the nation. He's been on the show uh, several times before. Uh, he is a uh, a local guy to me down here in South Florida, but he's heavily in security. He's got a law enforcement background, and uh, he's really into protecting schools and churches and synagogues. And so, you know, with everything that's going on, that's why I wanted to bring him on. So, without further ado, let me bring on. My good friend Wayne, how you doing? I'm fine. Thanks for having me. Oh, sure. Uh, so Wayne, I I know you've been on the show before, and uh, uh, just just you know your your company is Wayne Black and Associates, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. So what what exactly is Wayne? I know you're Wayne Black, but what's exactly Wayne Black and Associates? What do you guys do? It's a it's a basically a, six, a security consulting firm. We do some investigations, but primarily what we're doing now is threat assessments uh, and uh, security surveys at, at schools, houses of worship, churches, synagogues, etc. We're trying to keep uh, do what we can to keep people safe. Most of these, as you know, Eric, most of these schools and synagogues uh, don't know what they don't know because they're not in that space. And so by the assessment, uh, we can tell them where the the weaknesses are. Uh, when I ran a briefly ran a red team for Homeland Security after the events of 9/11, uh, we our motto was we think like the enemy. And so when you go into a school or, or your listeners go into school, they see a bunch of kids running around, cute little kids, and their heads bobbing around to and from classrooms or on the playground. What I see, and I can't help it, when I walk into a school. I see a guy at the end of the hallway with a rifle, and I immediately start to think about, well, how did he get in, the doors open, and what can we do to, to have maximum survivability there in the school? So th that's that's what drives me. You've, you've done some protection detail work and uh, for some from some pretty high clients. Can, can you share some of those, those clients uh, for the listeners and viewers? Sure, I'm happy to do that. I've got a lot of experience in, in what we're talking about now. Uh, after he left the Pentagon, 
uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld um, got me involved in running his PSD, his personal security detail. So I was just honored for a decade to travel around the world with him. Every summer we went to Asia, um, different everything from Mongolia to Kyrgyzstan uh, for his fellowship. He brought a lot of the leaders from uh, Central Asia, the Central Asian Caucasus, to Johns Hopkins for PhDs. And and uh, I just love the guy. And unfortunately, he passed away uh, two Junes ago, and we buried him in Arlington. But that was that was quite the experience. And uh, he, I, I, I always loved him because the way he handled, I don't think anyone's handled the media better than, than he does. I know there's a lot of professional talkers out there who are in that press secretary uh, position. Uh, but he was, he was a sec def and he <laughs> just would put people in their spot. And I know a lot of people, you know, maybe they're, they're too young to even remember that, but uh, he was, this was during the Gulf war and, you know, we tuned in all the time. That's how these, these 24 hour news networks got their started where, where it was during these Gulf wars, you know, like the first Gulf war, yeah, that that pretty much made CNN. We were watching live there, but the second Gulf War, when we were watching, uh, you know, all these cameras in Iraq and and the stuff was coming down, and you were just seeing it for the. I remember seeing there almost like with popcorn, you know, watching it. It was like couldn't believe that you're actually seeing war happen, or or of what was like a war happening at the same time. But yeah, he would come out there with those those briefings, and he was just uh, direct, and he handled the media uh, very well. It was, uh, Pretty decent leader. Yeah, he was he was prophetic and, and prescient at the same time. You know, he wrote three books. He wrote uh, No to None, Though, which is where those speeches came from. Uh, Rumsfeld's Rules and uh, When the Center Held with regarding Gerald Ford, which was a very close prodigious. They were in Congress together, and Ford made him uh, first, uh, made him chief of staff. He hired a young, he, Rumsfeld, hired a speechwriter named Dick Cheney, and he became then the youngest Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld did, in history under Ford, and the oldest in history under Bush 43. So he would often say in his very speeches that we would talk about it, and it applies to schools. And he was also concerned about schools. The know and the unknown speech. We know what we know. We don't know what we don't know, meaning uh, uh, we, we know what we, I'm sorry, we know what we know, we know what we don't know, meaning if there's a flight that's going to be canceled or something like that. But we don't know what we don't know. And that's how it applies to schools. And he would say, those are the things that really get you. So schools really don't know what they don't know. And in addition to that, typically we've had a failure of imagination in this country. You know, every time there's a school, we go, oh, not again. And we think, not me, not you, but some of us think, wow, I'm glad that didn't happen at my school. And it's not going to happen again. It's always somebody else's school. And then it happens again. And then we're all, as a nation, mourning again and just over and over and over. So the, the, the thought of the book uh, was to keep that from happening. Uh, there's just no, there are many reasons kids get shot in school. But there's not one good reason. There's not one good reason that, that they would be. So there's a clear way to protect American and that's what the book's about. It starts out empowering parents to ask questions. We learned so much during COVID, right? We learned about who's teaching our kids and what they're teaching them and all that. Uh, and so it's a constant fight between school boards and, and uh, school administration and parents that, that don't understand each other. So this book gives parents my checklist of questions to ask school boards and they better answer because you know the, the latin term in loco parentis means in place of the parents the schools the boards the principals the headmasters are absolutely 100 percent responsible not only to teach but to keep our kids safe so when i go into a school and i ask them about their plan sometimes i hear well we have a security committee I go, what are you talking about? They say, well, we've got a security committee, and it's made up of uh, of teachers. And the IT guy's on there, and the head of maintenance is on there, a couple teachers, and, and we decided what we're going to do to protect the school. 
And uh, and more than once I've said, you know what I'm going to do probably if you as a security committee are doing doing school safety plans, I'm thinking about doing appendectomies in the parking lot on weekends because that's about that's about the same thing. And typically, unless there's a law enforcement person on the committee, um, they have no idea of of the proper way to do things. It's, anyway, it's really simple. Long story short, that's the purpose of the book, and it covers it just covers everything. All right, so we're we're right into it. You know, uh, want to do a little bit of a preamble, but we're we're into the book, and uh, so let's let's start with. Uh, uh, so people know this is a book that's coming out soon. What what's the title of the book? The the title of the book I thought would be School Insecurity, not school security because our schools are not secure. So it's really insecurity, and uh, uh, you'll see on the cover there's a there's a little guy writing on the back board over and over again. Please protect our schools. Please protect our schools, and and so um, we talk about everything. There's a manifesto in there that the editors and and even my family told me was a little dark, but we've we've put a manifesto in there, a typical one. I took pieces and parts from five different manifestos that uh, active killers have written and put it in the book. And so that really gets your attention, brings you to the whole purpose of the book. And that's followed up with some terms and definitions and law enforcement response, et cetera. But it's really a guide for parents and educators to think about what they're doing, everything from locking their doors to sophisticated camera systems. So wh- why did you uh, feel the need to write the book at this time? Well, you know, I just, I thought about it for a while. It took me um, probably six or seven months I had a, 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 a ghostwriter with me, and uh, she was fantastic. Melinda Bryce brought her down from up north, and we visited schools, and we looked at schools that were not so, not so good, and schools that were just really what I would call bulletproof, uh, no pun intended. Um, so she really understood and and caught on pretty quickly. And so you know, as as us and and law enforcement would do, we threw a bunch of ideas down. Um, she tape recorded me for a few hours and I'd get a stream of consciousness and she put the paragraphs together um, with basically on, on what I said. And so before you got into writing this book, just so people who don't remember, or I'll link the different episodes down below uh, in whatever show notes you're looking at, but uh, you're, you're very much into, like I said earlier in the intro, into uh, religious institution security, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, very much. Um, and we shoot, we probably across the country, Montana, Colorado, Florida, Delaware, with religious institutions, we, we've probably donated our time, meet no charge. Um, they would fly us there to do it, and we would do an assessment, give them a great report, and then help them uh, with our FPs, requests for proposals from camera companies and alarm companies and things like that. So just basic, basic good stuff. I always go back to this arc. There's no good reason for a child to be shot in a school in this country. And it's so simple. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk about some of those things. And you had mentioned just literally a couple of seconds ago about what questions parents should ask the school. So what questions should the parents ask a school? Well, it's all in the book. There's about probably 15 pages, and it's the it's the questions and the and the potential response. But for example, who's in charge? That's the most important thing. So, assuming that the parent stands up at a meeting of the school of the educators or the PTO or the PTA or the school board, and they say, "Who owns it? Who owns protecting my child? Who is responsible ultimately for my child's safety?" So. In, in a state, you could say who's responsible for the safety of the citizens. You could say the governor. In the country, it's the president. In the in a county, it's the sheriff or the chief of police. But who owns it in a school, and and who who's actually taking charge? And that question alone will cause the school board. I've seen it to look back and forth at each other and say, I "Wonder who's in charge? Is the principal? Is the superintendent? Doesn't matter. 
that they need to, the parents need to get an answer. And then Eric hold those people accountable for the safety of their kids in loco parentis. So that's the first question. Second one is what's the security budget? How much money do we spend? I hear a lot. Well, we don't have a budget for cameras this year. We don't have a budget to fix the locks. Uvalde, right? Remember that? Terrible shooting. The doors were broken. The locks were, they didn't fix the locks. How much is that? And then, and then the, the, the thought to have in mind for parents is, and they should ask this, what is the value of a child in terms of dollars? Well, tell me about your budget. What's my child worth? What is my child's life worth? And that really, hopefully, will bring, bring people to the table. And one school, they, they didn't have a security budget, but the teachers were going on these, on these boondoggle trips to Las Vegas, right? A teacher's conference in Las Vegas, thousands of dollars. Okay, so use Zoom, Zoom for that conference and put some cameras in the, in the school, lock the doors. Just, all, just basic stuff. So I'm going to play devil's advocate, uh, even though I don't subscribe to anything I'm about to say. But I just wanted to throw it out there because I'm sure someone is going to be thinking these things. So you you travel to different places. So there are, there are actual school board areas that don't provide security for the schools right now? Absolutely. They say they do, but it's some kind of security. It's, well, I hear this a lot, Art. Uh, we want to have an open environment. We don't want to live out locked camp. Um, so we, we don't want to lock the doors. You know, We want to leave the classroom doors open so the kids don't feel locked in. And then the, behind that is they leave the hallway doors open to the building. So one of the first things I do when I do an assessment is I arrive an hour early. And most of the time, when I'm set to meet the headmaster or the principal or the, or doesn't matter where, where the building is, it could be the rabbi, could be the, the priest, I'm sitting in their office. So I just walk right in. So what about the argument that you don't want to, your kid to see someone with a gun because it's going to be too scary for them. I hear that I, one a lot, actually. Yeah, thanks for asking that. I see that a lot. It's not the kids, it's the parents, and that occurs in blue states mostly. Um, the parents have this gun thing for some reason. And if you approach kids, right, and when you raise your kids, I raise mine this way, police officers are good people. They're, that's the officer-friendly program, right? If you have a problem, go to a police officer. So the kids typically think guns are cool. They they feel better. Um, I was at a school in in uh, in Delaware, and the school sort of said, "Well, I don't know if we want armed people." And but I asked the kids, "Well, that'd be great." They they see the armed people protecting the president, the members of Congress, the mayor of big cities. They see armed people protecting shopping malls banks, everything else. They, the kids don't care. Typically, it's the parents. And that's so short-sighted, you know. Uh, it's difficult sometimes. But yeah, I hear that a lot. Thanks for asking me. Well, another one that I hear is we don't want uh, our children going to school in a prison, right? We don't want to see metal detectors. We don't want to see uh, everything locked up. It's it's going to affect them growing up, being going to school in a prison. I hear that too once in a while. What they need to do is talk to the parents who have lost kids. Talk to those parents from Parkland. Talk to the parents from Rivaldi, Sandy Hook, Columbine. You only have one child, or they they only have one life, I should say. Some of the best schools in the country, security-wise, are using um, clear backpacks. And and they have security up front. So it's a, it's a deterrent. They're a harder target. In the most recent shooting in Nashville, remember that the shooter, I won't mention the name, the shooter went to a mall, but they had security. 
so the school that that uh, they shot up was a was a softer target. So the question is, would they have done what they did if someone was watching a camera that said, "Hey, there's a person in the parking lot with a rifle," and would they have done what they did if there was a sheriff's deputy armed uh, outside the school? Probably not. They didn't go in someplace else. Well, again, I'm going to play another devil's advocate. So you look at Yuvaldi when he when he was walking up. If I'm watching the video correctly, in my mind, there were law enforcement officers who are already on scene. Right? He 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 crashes. The people go to help him. He shoots at them, but then as he's making it uh, his way towards that that side door, there were officers already responding. But that didn't deter him. Well, uh, it would have been a, it would have been a deterrent if they would have shot him, right? They had the opportunity, and that very early on, uh, and they chose not to. So he was dedicated. Um, the doors were open. He was able to walk in. Would would he have been deterred if he would have been not able to get in, and they would have done what they should have done and engaged him outside? Yeah, that was that was a mess. We could talk about that for hours. Uh, half of those people probably bled to death because of the cowardice of the of the officers who did not engage. Okay, um, I mean, yeah, having so we'll we'll get into that. So what what because in your book it also says uh, uh, what is the role of security and law law officers at schools? So what what is the role if they are they decide to go that route? What is the role? Is to protect the children, protect life. I and mean, that's really that really simple. That's what they're there, you know. And if they don't, then I I I've told security officers this in some of our firearms classes. If you don't want to engage, or you don't think you can engage an active killer, you should turn in that badge and sell car insurance, or teach school, or something. Don't do this if you don't think you can engage. You're not positive you can engage, and if you don't train to engage. But the, the the recent shooting in Nashville, the audio on that, as you know, was great. Remember the guy yelling, saying, let's go, let's go, let's go, push, push, push. That's exactly what should have happened in Ebaldi, uh, but it didn't. And I think, I talked to Harley Stock, you know, Dr. Harley Stock, who's a, a well-known forensic psychologist here in, in this part of the country, and he said, about Uvalde, he said this, it was fight, flight, or freeze. They froze, and then they had groupthink. Groupthink took over. So after the first four or five people didn't engage, it's possible, he says, that the, all those other 20, 30, or 40 people were neurologically incapable of engaging. It's pretty interesting. And the guy that did engage, remember, finally, Vortec guy, was at a barbershop, so he wasn't there uh, at the time. Um, and I'm I'm mindful of the video of the the police officer whose wife was a school teacher. Remember that? And he came. Yep. She called him, and he came. And they tapped him on the shoulder, and he didn't engage. They just said, "Okay, wait, wait, wait." And he the the shooting was taking place, and he didn't go in to save his wife, and his wife died. So I, I, in my head, I can't even fathom it. No. Um, something else uh, that you, you mentioned there is the most effective physical safeguards for preventing an attack. So besides making sure the doors are locked and they can lock, what, what other physical barriers are you talking about? Every school is different, but it's really layers of security. You know, when, when we're protecting someone, a, a VIP, or when I was protecting Mr. Rumsfeld, I knew that my plan had to be better than the bad guy's plan. So we always had a plan. And if we had to go to gun, if we ever had to go to gun, our plan had failed. And we're down to that last 5% of survival if you have to go to gun. Because really, as you know, from your tactical training, the shooter controls the environment especially at the beginning. And we're just responding to the shooter's actions or whatever it is. So what can we do at schools? Layered security. 
a perimeter, a gate, a gatehouse, a fence, depending on where the school is. Um, people outside would be another perimeter. Security officer watching, not in the school, but outside watching. Um, teachers with uh, walkie-talkies uh, that they would have when they for drop-offs and pickup. Okay, they would be they would be able to see what's going on. A SOC, an SOC, a security operations center. Someone watching the outside cameras of the of the school that's on a radio to report to the police officer that or the armed security guy that's there. So all those things. And then going in, locked doors when people aren't coming in and out, the perimeter doors of the school, uh, a choke point, primary entrance, one or two places only. Not all the doors open, not open for smoking, not rocks, little rocks propped open the doors, things that you see. And then lastly, when class is in session, the classroom door should be locked. Right. You don't want someone to come and interrupt the class. So all those things, again, are it could depend on the school. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned how to detect and report observable concerning behavior. Is that basically see something, say something? Pretty much. Um, that's, a, that's a topic that Steve Tarani, your friend Steve Tarani, teaches quite a bit about. Um, and he's involved with the National Sheriff's uh, Community Security and, and Safety Committee for Schools. We've got to get to the point where we're not afraid to say, you know, little Johnny came to school and he, he looked different, he smelled different, he cried and clapped. That's observable concerning behavior. Somebody's got to do something. We're there to help them. So that's a, that's a contact between the, the, uh, the teacher who observed it or a student who observes it and to the principal, to the mental health counselor. Somebody's got to do something. Look at the guy from Parkland. Look at all the observable concerning behavior that he had for a long period of time, right? And it was, sometimes it was reported, sometimes it wasn't. He could have been stopped, in my opinion. So, oh, oh, what I call OCB, observable constraint behavior, is very important. So, what is the the avenue for something like that? It, I mean, you, you have this behavior, but who's reporting it, and and how's it getting reported? Depends on the school. Some schools have mental health counselors, and they have a a, a policy and a, even a written policy set up that you can report changes in behavior and things like that, threats, bullying, and then the school takes care of it. The private schools that I've found around the country that have a big waiting list um, are less tolerant of, of people doing weird things. And so they'll boot somebody out because they've got a waiting list. They've got people you know, waiting to put their child in a, in a private school to spend thirty, forty, or $50,000 a year um, and they get them out. Public schools, not so much. Um, they all should be the same. Now, if you see something that should be handled, not put off, well, they'll probably be okay. Going back to Columbine, look at Klebold. Right? He had observable concerning behavior. He did it. He was dyed his hair. He wore these trench coats. He went totally gothic. He stood out like a sore thumb. Yet they kept him in school. So you mentioned private schools. In in your experience and travels, because I know a lot of the public schools get law enforcement officers as school resource officers. But at the private schools, they don't, so they have to hire private security. Do they seem, I don't want to say more professional, but do they seem more prepared to handle things, or is it the, the school resource officers that are generally more prepared. Well, if they're if school resource officer, it's a law enforcement person versus contract security. There's no doubt the SRO is about to be in great shape. But in a lot of schools around the country and here in South Florida, we have retired law enforcement people who are proprietary employees of the of the school, and they're there every day, and they know the kids, and they're well trained, and they're they're all they're on top of it. So in that case, even that is better than an SRO that might rotate. Um, a lot of those private schools hire off-duty police officers 
in addition to their to their proprietary staff. So I always tell people, you know, hire off the police officer. Well, it might be in South Florida now. It's sixty dollars an hour, sixty five an hour. So yeah, but on that guy's lapel is a radio, and if he calls a help for help, you're paying him sixty five an hour, but you're going to get a hundred guys for free if you have a problem. So it's it's well worth it to have live comms, live communication with the with the local police department. So do you also help schools and school boards come up with uh, active shooter policy or are you strictly sticking to, with this book with uh, the parents? No, we help. We help with policy, uh, emergency response plans, um, and we like to keep it simple, really simple. Some schools, when they have the security committees, they come up with about four or five permutations of lockdown, for example. Well, it's a code purple, uh, you lock the doors. It's a code yellow, you need, nobody knows when that, with an emergency, they don't know what to do, they're gonna forget. You either lock down or you don't lock down. Um, and and I, I preach that you don't, you do not evacuate on a real fire drill. Now that sounds funny, most of these shooters pull the fire, pull the fire alarm. There hasn't been a child burned in the school since 1947, and we're required because of those archaic old fire marshal regulations to have fire drills. That's great. Fire drill. But if the fire alarm goes off when it's not a drill, unless you smell smoke or see fire, you should keep those kids in the school. We worry about a, this, what we call a CCA, a complex coordinated attack. If Vegas, for example, would have been that shooting in Vegas would have been a, a complex coordinated attack, a couple shooters could have killed 5,000 to 10,000 people, remember, because they ran them into the funnel. Same with the school. You, by locking down, you limit exposure. So, okay, you, you, you brought up an interesting point. Uh, I've spoken with fire chiefs and they they are kind of in agreement with that about the fire you know sometimes it's safer not to go out of your room when the, even if there is a fire because you're putting yourself expose yourself to jeopardy now if the fire is coming to you and you have to get out you get out but like you said if you're not smelling smoke if you're not seeing flames uh it might be safer for you to stay where you're at i think that a lot of this a lot of these policies that that are out there are based off of liability more than security because i think you know having kids run out if there's an active shooter going on active killer going on well what if we lose track of where those kids go versus go ahead right. What if, what if they get run over by a parent coming to get their kids? That, an emergency vehicle. You've been to tons of emergencies. You see what happens. It's total chaos. We don't know where they are. How about a bomb threat to a school? Some schools still evacuate. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. They run kids out into the street willy-nilly, especially if you've heard the term herding cats. In elementary school, you can't control kids. Do they run out? Do they walk out? Do they hold hands? What do they do? And, and if they, even if there is a plan, it typically it doesn't work. There's never been a bomb go off at a school where there's been a call-in bomb threat. And probably most bomb threats, the same thing. I can think of one when I first went to work for Miami-Dade PD. It was called Metro at the time. There was, a, there was a bomb threat at a radio station, and it went off just within seconds. But other than that, I think if you Google it, you'd find that there isn't any. But yet, some schools evacuate on a bomb threat. So, let's say there's a briefcase with an explosive device and some nails in it, and it's outside the school. And it does go off. And kids are inside, it's going to break a bunch of windows. The standoff distance for a briefcase bomb is about a football field. The survivable standoff distance. So. If you evacuate the kids into the parking lot, 
or the tennis court or the football field and the bomb is out there, guess what? Most of those kids are probably not going to survive. So I have to explain this and it works when I explain it to to uh, headmasters and principals and, and boards. It typically works. I, sometimes I, I draw it on a blackboard. Sometimes I talk to them about low order explosive versus high order and what it does, crashing versus sucking and all that. But I think they get it, but still there are schools that, that want to evacuate because it's a knee jerk and the committee thinks it's a good idea. Yeah, I, I can't imagine, again, coming back to liability, you mean you didn't evacuate from a bomb threat? What if there was a bomb, right? It's always the, the what if there is. And so, yeah, you make this policy, well, you, you've got to evacuate because there's a bomb threat and this is how we do it. Where's the bomb? It's a kid that wants to get out of class, or it's a mm-hmm. kid, or it's a kid of school. Where's the bomb? And and you and I know, especially in our jurisdictions down here, that bomb squad isn't coming to church to search the school. What are they going to do? Look for backpacks? <laughs> They're not coming unless there's advice. And how long are they going to stay out? And where are you going to search? And all the it's just it doesn't make sense. Now remember that in Columbine. Klebold had placed secondary devices in the parking lot that didn't work. So what did they want? They pulled the fire alarm. They wanted everybody to run outside so they could take out hundreds of people instead of just the, the ones they shot. Yeah, I think in the end, uh, going back to Columbine, it was 60, 60 IEDs that they placed. Yep. And uh, they obviously didn't study how to do it well because they didn't go off, uh, especially the one that they were supposed to go off uh, in the cafeteria. That, you know, uh, but I don't want to digress to, to Columbine. Uh, let's stick to something more recent, let's stick to Nashville. Now you're going up to Nashville, uh, before we get to the reasons why, in Nashville, looking at the, the video uh, of the surveillance cameras, they blew out, uh, the, the, the assailant shot up the windows, the glass windows and came in. I'm guessing you're going to say that glass windows are probably a bad idea unless they're bulletproof. Yeah, unless, well, bulletproof is about $800 a square foot. Ballistic film is about $150 or $160 a square foot. And we always recommend that schools on the first floor put that on their windows, at least the lower half of the windows. And, um, and that would have stopped that person from gaining entry with that 9 millimeter. Um, Caltech, that everybody says is an assault rifle. By the way, well, remember the we're we're in 1984 now. For those of you who actually read uh, 1984 in that book, they they talk Newspeak, and so now we have Newspeak. So if you say things enough times, they become reality. So I mean, a, an assault rifle is usually a fully automatic, uh, like large caliber rifle. Uh, now any AR style rifle is an assault rifle. So yes, uh, you know, we have assault pistols now apparently. Uh, so the terminology has has definitely shifted and what an assault rifle is. Uh, yeah, it was a Caltech 9, but I thought they, you know, I saw pictures from the, the evidence they showed and she had a, a Smith & Wesson M&P uh, 380. She had that Caltech. And then they did show, I, I looked up the, I've never seen the brand before, uh, of an AR. She did have the AR, I guess, slung. And I guess she was shooting at the cops from the second floor with the AR, but when she entered, she was using the Caltech. That's, that, right. I think that is correct. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, Wikipedia just came up recently, in the last few years, with a definition of an assault rifle. People used to call the AR. Right. The company Armalite, right? Armalite. Made and they, they thought that AR... Uh, was a they meaning the media whoever made it up was an assault rifle um and you and i both know that that it's a that the a of the ar brand the 223 is a very popular home defense rifle and sporting rifle and and people talk about well do you need that rifle to hunt deer and and that rifle may not kill a deer so most people don't hunt deer with with a little 223 round um so it's just hopefully we'll get to the truth one day. But anyway, I digress. Uh, yeah, uh, I I don't think you're living in the right time in the right country for for that to happen the way things are going. Because um, yeah, we're we're definitely uh, 
uh, shifting the Overton win window, so they say. Um, but speaking of windows, so that that film that you're talking about that that would would they have that stop an AR caliber? Yeah. yeah, I didn't believe it, but we we've, we've tested it, um, and there are a lot of uh, a lot of institutions in South Florida, including schools, that have it. So it's great. So you can turn a, uh, for example, a, a a glass conference room into a hard room at your corporation. Mm -hmm. Everybody likes the new glass open look, the the South Beach type of look. Put that that window film on there, and you can't see it, and it's semi permeable nanotechnology, which means, and I've shot it. I never believed it, Ark. You can shoot out through it, but not into it. Oh, that's cool. So, so with the nine millimeter, you can just shoot right out at the bad guy, and the bad guy cannot shoot you. Now, like any other ballistic film, if they shoot the exact same space, exact same space over and over and over again, it, it's eventually going to defeat it. But the people inside can move away from that space. And you said it was 150 a foot? Yeah, 150, 160 dollars a square foot. That's really on interesting. The, yeah, yeah, I've never it, heard of that. It's cheap thrills. Uh, so, but if they don't want to go that route, you know, making sure that you've got some sort of steel door uh, that locks probably be the, the, the second best option. Yes. Yep. Yeah. It's you know it slows down the bad guys. It either be, be creates a hard target where they're going to go someplace else or where it's going to slow them down enough that the police can get there in time. So if you can, you've got to survive, as you know, you've got to survive whether it's your home or whatever it is um, until the police get there. You know, when seconds count, the police are only minutes away. And you're going to Nashville now. You said you're, you're leaving tomorrow. What, what, what are you doing up in Nashville? Is it related uh, to the shooting? Yeah, well, it is. Yeah, uh, indirectly, it's other schools that are close and worried, and they see the video. They wait a minute. They could probably do that here. So, let's let's talk about hardening the target. So that's what I'm going to do. And I, I seem to recall uh, up in Tennessee, uh, a good friend of ours, Kyle Lamb, lives. And didn't you uh, go up there to be on his podcast once? Yep, two or three times. Yep. In fact, um, hopefully, I'm going to see Kyle. He lives uh, about ten miles from this uh, this school, and if I can get him over there to talk to the teachers uh, with me, I'm happy to do that. that. That would be great. That would be very cool. And of course, when you're up there, please, please tell him I said hi. I will. Uh, I haven't I haven't talked to him for for I think a year or two, so I'd like to have him on the show again. But uh, I'd also like to see him. He he told me to come up there one time. I just you know life is just so busy. Uh, I gotta, I gotta make time. I've always wanted to go up to, uh, to Tennessee and, uh, you know, see Nashville, but I have, I have friends who've retired who are now living up in Tennessee and, and they're enjoying life. And so it's definitely, uh, on the bucket list, but I love to hang out with, with that guy and, and, you know, just sit down and talk with him about things. So yeah, please say hi for me. I will. There are a lot of, of SF guys who, when they retired, um, bought farms and, and homes in, in Tennessee. I went to Kyle's church, actually, and talked about church security. I thought it was a 511 commercial. <laughs> He's got these, got these guys, you know, former operators, and they've got little earpieces, and there was, there's nobody going to come to that church because they, you know, they're going to give you the eyeball when you come in. They're going to make sure. So that church and the, the, the pastor actually told me, he said, Hey, did you know I'm carrying a Glock 19? <laughs> so he goes shooting with them. So it's a, it's the perfect uh, perfect scenario. Yeah, that's like when the bad guy goes into the bar and it's a cop bar. Which, well, they really don't have cop bars anymore. But back in the day, you know, people go off work and they go to the bar and, and hang out. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's probably the, the worst place in the world for the bad guy to go shoot it up. Um, so you're going up there to talk uh, church security and school security, and, and unfortunately, uh, in Nashville, it, it was a church school. It wasn't just a school; it was a church school. 
that uh, was shot up by by this deranged individual. Um, and so that's right up your wheelhouse because I know you're you're just you're very heavy in the the church and the, the religious institution security. So that's that's very cool that you're you're going out there to help out. Uh, so this book, uh, the school and security, uh, when when's it? It's due to come out in a couple months. It'll be out. Um, they tell me July fifteenth. And so that, uh, you can yeah. pre-order it. Yeah, you can pre-order it now. Um, <clears throat> they told me today. Amazon told me the day that. We announced it like two days ago, and we've already got a couple hundred pre-orders. Um, so that's been one one company ordered fifty for their employees. Um, so I think it'll help. It'll really. I think school boards are are not going to like it so much, but uh, no, I parents, can see that parents are parents are going to love it. I hope um, it, it comes out, and then it's going to be at Barnes and Noble and on Amazon. Yeah, because I, I feel that that. Most parents, as much as they feel strongly about it, they kind of acquiesce the security to, well, there's law enforcement or there's security and they must know what they're doing. And uh, yeah, they're, they're probably not. Uh, and even if they are, you should still keep the, you know, them to the fire, getting answers and making sure that they're constantly doing things and learning from the past. You know, you, you, you said it about this Nashville shooter that they went to a mall, I think they went to another school, they were looking at another school that all had armed security, and went to this one because um, I think there was a connection, and it's very interesting, we don't, we haven't seen the actual stuff yet, they've, they've withheld it for whatever reason, but they, she went to that school and there's no security there. And that's that's kind of been a common thread where these people are shooting up places where they know there's not gonna be security, that they're not going to be engaged with somebody, at least initially, because Obviously, they want to kill as many people in the shortest amount of time. No, yeah. well, remember going back to and this is this is more of a terror approach. Mm -hmm. 1993, Ramsey Youssef mm -hmm. came to the United States to shoot up a Hebrew school. Mm -hmm. Had too much security, so what they did was they they discharged that truck, that van in the basement of the World Trade Center, um, and so that started that whole ball rolling. If they if it's if it's a terror attack, they want to succeed. And probably some of these active killers want to succeed. They may be going in there to, to end up dying, suicide by cop, but they want to reach as much, uh, wreak as much havoc as they can. So they want to pull it off. Well, uh, not that I want to talk about it, but, you know, yeah, we, we really haven't seen here a, a terror attack. So that that's a whole other animal. And, we could do a whole other podcast on on protecting from the terror attack. I mean, yeah, there's a commonality between the active shooter and and the terrorist. However, we're not talking a lone wolf terrorist. We're talking about an actual terror group, Al Qaeda, Hezbollah. Uh, those guys are very well trained and 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 disciplined and coordinated. And we're going to be dealing with something completely different if we have to deal with that at some point down the road. And I, I hope to God that we don't. Well, brace yourself. It's going to happen. Look, even these guys coming across the border, and we've caught over 100 known terrorists, but these other guys from Syria, Nigeria, 60 countries, uh, Iran, Iraq, they're not coming here to pick strawberries for somebody in California or Arizona or Texas. They're coming here to do something. And now recently, Chinese nationals, right? And they're funded. They come across the border with a brand new iPhone 80, and full camo. I mean, but it is so simple to see, and we just keep allowing it to happen. Again, hopefully, we won't have that podcast, but uh, hopefully, people are prepared, and people can be prepared for their for their children. Uh, go out and and purchase uh, Wayne's book. Uh, I'll link it down below. You can at least pre-order it. It's coming out soon. Uh, school and security that's you know the play on words that's easy to remember uh wayne black and associates if if you're interested in hiring him or his firm i mean they are uh, a very high class uh full service security they do everything from investigations to personal security details for all variety of clients uh so uh reach out to him again i'll link it down below uh, 
best way for people to get in touch with you, Wayne? They could call me direct on my cell phone, 305-525-8013. I'm here to give advice. And, and uh, even if we we if we're not engaged, I'm going to help whoever calls with a way to make that happen. So with some of these some of these school boards, I think they need to do their job or we should make them infamous or famous, whichever whichever comes first. We learned a lot in COVID, didn't we, about what was happening with our kids. So this is about empowering parents. They have These schools have got to protect our kids. If your school isn't protecting your kids, you should take them out of school and homeschool them or put them in some charter school or some private school or something. We only have one child. I've talked to a ton of parents and they they realize now what they should have done, but it, it's too late because that child is not going to come home. Well, I thank you for uh, taking time right before your uh, trip to Nashville. And again, say hi to Kyle for me. And uh, thank you for what you're doing. It's very important. Uh, I feel safer knowing that you're around. And uh, we'll talk soon, brother. Thank you. Thank you for everything.